Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we are heading back to the woods to encounter one of the most feared and elusive creatures, the Skimwalker. I hope you're ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. A cool autumn morning in mid-October is where our story begins, in a small but quaint town near Clemson County, where the Tugaloo River stands. My friends and I, L and J, went up to the mountainous region to enjoy a weekend full of camping. What we planned to do aside from lodging and camping out in a rustic cabin, was to hike the vast trails and rugged terrain to hunt for our meals and sleep underneath the stars. Our trip was planned in advance, and as such, all of us thought we had everything covered, every contingency prepared for. But as we would later discover, we were horrifically wrong in that assumption of ours. Our first morning in the mountains was met with a beautiful sunrise the likes of which I doubt any of us had ever seen before. Steadily it rose to grace us, blessing all its light touched with warmth and loving radiance. Groggily I got out of bed, still exhausted from the previous night, as I was the one who drove for the last half of the trip. After waking up a little more, I got dressed and headed downstairs to meet the rest of my group, L and J. As we gathered and sat down for breakfast, we began to discuss the first thing we would do that day, laughing our asses off as we joked and prodded at one another, teasing, making jabs in an effort to get one of us to drive about the area so the others didn't have to. We finished packing for the day ahead of us and loaded into the car, the attempts at persuasion from earlier failing me as I ended up driving yet again and so began our trek into the wilderness around us. Works for me, I thought, as I drove down the winding trail. I get to see it all up front, while those two make out in the back seat. Now to each their own. I know, but I was a little bit disgruntled at them for not taking in the scenery, so I decided to sweeten the mood. Apparently swerving on a winding incline was not the best course of action, even jokingly, as my prank was soon met with a hard smack to the face. What the hell? Elle exclaimed. Are you gonna be retarded the whole trip? I chuckled. Calm down, I was just horsing around. I mean, you two are having your fair share of fun. Isn't it right I only get to have mine? Elle sneered and said, please don't do it again. You just about made me wet myself. I thought we were gonna perish. If you're gonna joke around like that, at least make sure we're not on a narrow bend like this, okay? I sighed. Okay, I'm sorry. My apologies, your highness. After a while, I chuckled again and said, you know, if I wanna be lectured, I'd stay at home and have my ear talked off by my mother. We'd finally reached our destination. The fallen leaves decorated the forest floor, crisply crunching underfoot, as we made our way further into the hiking trail, walking deeper into the wooded realm that encompassed us. The trail was peaceful, filled with moments of silence and beauty, all of which was jovially brought to an end as Jay, being the country fan he is, began whistling a beloved tune. Soon we all chimed in, singing Take Me Home Country Roads, as none of us could resist the urge to sing to such a camp-friendly song. We continued humming various melodies, the last marking of the day's end as the sun began to set. The final tune escaped our lips as the moon began to rise, signaling the night's arrival, and with it, the subjects to its rule. The moon's full paleness and eerie light crept through the brambles and thickets of branches, its sickly touch sending chills down our backs. A cold shiver ran throughout our bodies, and L began to cling to Jay, obviously frightened, and said, Dill, maybe we should get going, like, now. 
You see, Elle's my best friend. And in the time we've known each other, whenever either of us gets a bad feeling, we take heed and turn away from the supposed risk. Just as we started to head back in the direction of the car, a shrill cry rang out, a deafening and blood chilling wail that snatched away whatever peace and tranquility was left in that night. We stood frozen with fear as our shackles, anxiety and uncertainty, the ball and chain. What the hell was that? Jay quickly asked. L hugged him tighter. Did you hear that Dill? We began to scan the area around us, making out whatever we could in the pale moonlit night. Our ears twitching at every sound they heard, our hearts slowing to a rhythmic pump as we fixated on something in the distance. What appeared to be two glowing whitish yellow orbs were in a nearby tree. As quickly as we saw them, the orbs vanished and that horrific wail resounded soon after, leaving us motionless from fear. Courage or stupidity took hold of us and we booked it back to the car against our better judgment as running from a predator was a bad idea due to their instinct to hunt and give chase to fleeing prey. We all came to the unified and unspoken decision that staying there with that thing was a worse idea than doing nothing. Finally, we made it. J and L got him first and I followed suit again in the driver's seat and I started the car. As soon as the headlights flicked on there in the brush, just barely visible, but perceivable enough to make out from its most horrific visage stood an actual monster. There are no other words for it. It's sickly pale yellow eyes stared into our souls as we looked back with the utmost horror imaginable. Our gaze met. It knew we were terrified of it. And honestly, it took pride in such a notion. Its skin was a reddened color, like tanned hide, only slightly darker, while its face from what little we could see was sharp and angular. On the next tree to it lay one of its grotesque hands just as monstrous as the rest of it, adorned with claws at the tips of its curled, elongated fingers. One leg was partially visible, and much to our dismay was bent and misshapen. That's when we knew, if this was a prank, it was the best damn prank ever, as no human leg is able to bend like that. Imagine how a dog's leg would be, or some other animal with the knee bent backwards, heels resting off the ground, all the while the pads of its feet lay nestled on the forest floor, its sharp claws digging into the dirt and leaves beneath where it stood. Then it cracked what appeared to be a smile, revealing rows of sharp and gnarled teeth, or dare I say, fangs. All of this, as drawn out as it seems, happened in the span of a minute or two. Just as quickly as we saw it though, it slithered away back into the brush. What in the ever loving hell was that thing? I asked, fear stinging my throat, tears burning my eyes, with L and J yelling at me to drive away. I snapped back to reality, threw the car into reverse, turned around, and gunned it down the path. To hell if it was a narrow road, and on that notion we agreed. After what felt like an anxiety ridden eternity, we finally arrived back at the cabin and slowly made our way inside. Not out of nonchalance or lack of care, but from shock and exhaustion, complete with utter disbelief. We all decided to sleep in the same room that night, huddled around one another, cold and pale as the grave. Elle was passed out from all the excitement of it all, while Jay was soon to follow from a rundown of his adrenaline high drive. But I managed to stay awake for a while longer, 
gripping tightly onto my hunting utensil as I sat on the edge of the bed. I tossed and turned and awoke at every sound that came from the woods, unable to get any decent sleep for what seemed to be hours upon hours, until I finally gave in to the idea of a well rested night. Screw that. I gave a defeated sigh. I couldn't sleep. I went downstairs for a drink and a bite to eat, still on edge as my heart pounded in my chest. There I sat in the kitchen eating my midnight snack, drinking away whatever that thing was from my memory. All of a sudden, as if on some dreadful cue, a chill runs down my back. It's the same chill I felt right before that creature showed up. A feeling of a lurking nearby danger. One that heralds the tendency for someone to proceed with an air of caution. A light tapping sounded at the window. And without thinking, I turned to look. In the darkness, two whitish yellow eyes shone from outside, beaming into the cabin as whatever they belonged to searched around. Then, they rose higher into the air, resting almost above the window frame. Whatever this thing was, it was tall, frightfully so. It put its hand on the window, but in the moonlight, it looked wet and redder than it did before. A fresh, vicious substance dripping from its claws. Slowly I backed away, and it did the same, but neared closer and closer to the door as it stepped from the window. Seeing the door was unlocked, I bolted for it and slammed up against it as it creaked, knocking whatever that hideous thing was away, and locking the door. I heard a slight grunt and what sounded like a growl, before it spoke. Let me in, Bill, Elle said from behind the door, her voice deepening and becoming more sinister in tone. There's a monster out here. Please don't let him get me. I stood there, weapon in hand, tears welling in my eyes, a gasp in my throat. And then it spoke again. But this time it wasn't in Elle's voice. Jay spoke, sinisterly and maliciously, taunting us to open the door. Let me in, little boy, let me in. It slammed against the door and let out this horrific wail. Then an ungodly scream. Jay and Elle ran downstairs looking as shocked and horrified as I felt. Let me in, it demanded again. Jay, open the door, please. It's not me in there with you. Jay became as white as a ghost, and then Elle fell to the ground, passed out from fear and disbelief. Dylan, Dylan, Dylan. They began to laugh and then spoke in my voice. If everyone else is having fun, is it in only fair that I get my fair share too? I blacked out after that. Morning came, the sun creeping over the horizons, slowly gracing us again. This sunrise was similar to the previous morning, and we finally understood why it had risen so slowly. It wasn't a gradual majestic sunlight. It was quite the opposite. Disturbed, scared, reluctant to mantle the throne in the heavens above us. We finally understood, and after packing up, we got the hell out of there and never returned. The mountains grew distant and soon faded as I drove back home. Although admittedly, I didn't mind being the driver this time. L and J refused to return there to the sprawling mountains, forested providence of Clemson County. But one day, I will. I love the woods and mountains. Nature itself is too much to be deterred by whatever evil lurks within the darkness there. I just pray that when I do venture back to the Clemson County retreat, 
all goes well for me, and that I return alive and sane, here's to hoping. I live in rural Idaho, about five miles from a reservation. Growing up, we heard all sorts of stories and legends surrounding the res. I have to admit, I was a bit of a skeptic when it came to the things we heard. My best friend and I have always been drawn to the paranormal. When we were about 16, 17, we decided we'd go for drives on the res at night. The area we live in has a very tight knit community, and our little town has just over 10,000 people. We basically have no crime, and everyone feels pretty safe. So driving around at night is no big deal. We went on our night's drive fairly often, with no experiences to note. One day, we had heard a story from someone at school about an abandoned schoolhouse on the other side of the reservation. Just past the schoolhouse, there was supposed to be a small bridge that went over a large farming canal. The story was that if you drove to the bridge and turned off your car, you could hear water babies. If you don't know what water babies are, they are a Native American folktale. They're supposed to be sprites in the shape of babies or young infants, and hearing their cry is allegedly an omen of death, or perhaps something terrible. So anyway, we decided this was going to be our next driving destination. Neither of us had ever heard a water baby cry, so we were interested. That night after dark, we jumped in my car and started driving out there. The closer we got to the schoolhouse, the more uneasy I began to feel. We drove past the building that was supposed to be the schoolhouse and stopped on the bridge. I cut the lights and killed the engine. There was silence. There was no sound but the rushing water below the bridge. We sat there, for what felt like forever, but in reality was probably no more than four to five minutes. We heard nothing but the water. We started joking about the stories being fake, and decided that it was time to go home. The keys were still in the ignition, so I simply tried to start the car. Nothing. The dash lights lit up, but it just wouldn't turn over. I'd never had any problem with the car before, I tried a few more times while talking to my friend, not wanting to freak her out. About the third or fourth time, I turned to her and said, I don't want to freak you out, but uh, the car won't start. Her eyes grew wide and she responded with, You're kidding me, right? I wish I had been. We sat there for a minute, just staring at each other, not knowing what to do. If we called my mum, there would definitely be some arse chewing for being out on the res so late at night. So we decided to call one of our friends that had a truck. If the battery was dead, he could give us a jump. If not, he could tow us back to town, I suppose. So we called and waited, sitting in the middle of this bridge in my dead car, frustrated from the lack of experience and car troubles. We just wanted to go home. That's when I saw it. It's a well known fact that the reservation has packs of wild dogs that roam around killing livestock, and there have been a few instances of them attacking kids and putting them in the hospital. This was no dog. I've seen coyotes and wolves, and there was no way in hell this was either of those things. It was skeletal, like a malnutritioned animal and walking on all fours slow and low to the ground. It was walking along the canal towards the bridge. I smacked my friend, making her turn to look at what I was staring at. We both stared in disbelief at this creature slowly coming towards us. Instinctively, I honked the horn. At least that still worked. That's when things got really weird. This thing stood up on two legs, arms limp at its sides, and I legit screamed. I had never seen anything like this in my entire life. The best way I can think to describe it is it looked like Professor Lupin's werewolf form in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. It was massive. It stood between eight to nine feet tall and was staring at us. It took a few steps forward, 
and my friend and I were frozen. We were trapped in a car that we couldn't start. As it slowly started walking towards us, headlights appeared in the distance. As the lights came closer, the creature dropped back to all fours and took off for the hills where I assumed it came from. Our friend pulled up to help us, and both my creeped out friend and I kept quiet about what we had just witnessed. He walked up to the car, and I rolled my window down. He suggested we push the car off the bridge to the side of the road and pop the hood. So I threw it in neutral, got to the side of the road, and my friend asked me to pop the hood and try to start the car. So I did. The damn car started right up. I don't know what caused it to not start before, but that night I had an experience I'll never forget, and I don't go out on the res anymore at night. I'd rather not see whatever it was that night again. One night, the dog was outside barking, so I got up and went out to look. As I was looking outside, the dog came back in and left me alone standing in the darkness next to the shed. I soon became aware of noises in the shed, but put it down as wind. That is until it moved closer and I felt a strong sense of dread surge through my body. I listened attentively to the sound. It almost sounded like a person was on all fours scuffling around. I heard the noise. It was moving towards the shed door. I fled. I ran inside and slammed the door. I sat down and tried to tell myself that it was just the wind. At first, the dread was going away, but then I could feel it building up again. It felt like it was trying to find a way in, moving back and forth along the walls of the house. Then, I suddenly felt it inside the apartment. It had made its way into the kitchen. I'm still unsure how. The window, perhaps? I could feel it getting slowly closer. I was too afraid to look behind me into the kitchen, but I managed to jump up and slammed the door. I hoped it would leave, and it did. After this, I would hear it sometimes, just scuffling around at night. The alley at the back was dark and smelly, so I assumed it liked it. Now this next bit is truly a fault on my own part. I really should have listened to my own gut feeling. Months later, it's summer, and therefore very warm. I had the back door open, and I was on my laptop as it got dark. At some point, I turned on the light and sat back down. I sat facing the back door. My laptop screen stopped me from seeing the bottom half of the door. After a while, I started hearing movement outside and felt uneasy, but I told myself it was nothing. Yep, I sat there and told myself it couldn't possibly be anything. I know, foolish. The feeling continued to grow stronger. My whole body was screaming at me to run. Then, our dog comes running downstairs, stops in the middle of the room, looks at me, and then goes to walk outside. The way she did this was just odd. I pulled down my screen and watched her head towards the back door. As she walked out, there was this thing. It was a humanoid figure crouched down by the door. Its skin dark brown like dirt and rot, with the texture of a burn victim. Hairless and skinny like it hadn't eaten in months. There it was. This thing that I had been of fear of for so long, right up against the doorframe, trying to make its way inside. The figure twisted its emaciated form around to follow the dog. It was crouched down onto its hands and feet. That's why it made a scuffling noise. I jumped up and threw my laptop to the floor. I ran upstairs and refused to go back down alone. The stupidest thing 
was that I doubted myself, and if it wasn't for that dog, I don't know what would have happened. Her look towards me when she came downstairs, I can only imagine she was wondering why I wasn't running away. A friend told me it sounds like a skimwalker. I don't know what it was, but I sure am happy that we moved. I'm 16 years old and live in the Western United States and I'm active in rodeo. This story happened in late winter. My brother and his close friend Tom got permission from a local reservation to use their arena to practice roping. We got there early in the morning, so we would have all the time we needed. Now mind you, my brother's horse and Tom's are both very even tempered and don't spook easily. My mare on the other hand will panic at the slightest of things and she can be a handful most of the time to be honest. Since the moment we got there, all of our horses seemed to be on edge, but we shrugged it off and figured that once they got used to their surroundings that they would be fine. After spending the better part of the day throwing ropes and chasing cattle, we decided to go for a trail ride to explore the area. By now the horses seem to have calmed down quite a bit. There is a river that ran close to the arena, so we decided to go down and check that out, as well as some animal tracks that we had seen. Once we got about 30 yards from the water, we could smell what could only be described as a rotting dead animal. Then something in the tree line caught the attention of all the horses, and after that, Mine flat out refused to go any further. Being tired from a long day and frustrated from my horse's lack of cooperation, we decided to call it a day. By this time, it was too late to load our gear and horses and take them back. So we decided it was just best to leave them there for the night and stay at Tom's because they lived closer than my brother and I. We got their stools ready for the night got them fed and watered and headed over to one of Tom's family friends who offered to cook us dinner. After some good food, good laughs and a few games of pool, the weird encounter by the river was out of mind. When nine o'clock rolled around, we all wanted to get some sleep, but I wanted to check on the horses one last time before we left. But when I mentioned this to Tom's family friend, he warned me to not go there alone at night. Wanting to respect that, Tom offered to drive down with me. We got in the truck and headed back to the arena. It was only a half mile drive back, but the roads were very icy. So we had to drive slower than what I would have liked. Before crossing the bridge that went over the river, this feeling of dread hit me like a ton of bricks. I looked out the window to be met with glowing yellow eyes. They're hard to describe because there was not enough light hitting them to make them glow the way they did. I'm a very rational person, but something in my gut told me that this was very wrong. That's when Tom turned to me and asked if I smelt that awful smell, which I hadn't even noticed until they said something. When I didn't respond, they looked at me and met my gaze just to see the same yellow eyes, the glare I was fixated on. We were both in terror, not knowing what this thing was because from where it sat, it had to have been at least eight feet tall and there are no animals that large in these parts. I finally came to my senses and hit the gas and our truck started sliding, but we caught traction and made our way back to the arena. When we pulled up, the headlights hit the horses, and the first thing I noticed was that my mare hadn't even touched her food, and that for her is very out of the ordinary. She's kind of a pig and normally eats more than her fair share. The other two hadn't touched their food either, which again was very strange, but being scared and cold, we got back in the truck and drove back without incident. We got to Tom's at about 11, and as soon as our head hit the pillows, we were out like a light bulb. All of a sudden, I woke up to my brother grabbing my arm and shaking me. When I asked him what was wrong, he just put his finger over his mouth and pointed to the window. 
There was a tapping on the glass, and an occasional scratch. I looked at the clock. It was around three a.m. Tom and I hadn't told him about our encounter on the bridge, but it was late, and I wasn't going to tell him now, and scare him even more. Trying to be rational, I told him just to ignore it and try and get some sleep. But knowing what had happened, I was convinced it was the thing from the reservation, and it had followed us back. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night, and as soon as the sun came up, I woke up Tom and my brother, so that we could get our horses and go home, because I didn't want my poor girl to be out with that thing any longer. I told Tom about the tapping and scratching after coffee, so we went to look by her window for tracks, and sure enough. There were what looked to be deer hooves, but they didn't track like normal deer. Almost like they were injured, but that still doesn't quite describe it. It only seemed to be one pair and not two, like it was walking on its hind legs. This spooked us, but we just wanted to go see if our horses were okay, so we headed back to the res. They were all fine, but the food and water was still untouched. We got them loaded up. And out of there as quickly as we could. As we drove over that bridge one last time, I looked into the tree line to see a massive buck staring at me. He was large, and I mean unnaturally large, but very sickly looking, like his skin was just falling from his bones, and his legs bent in an odd way. It wasn't the worst part though; it was his face, those same ungodly yellow eyes. But when I made eye contact, I swear this thing, whatever it was, smiled at me. I looked away, and looked back, and it was gone. Perhaps it just wanted to scare us one last time. I still have so many questions from that night, but the only thing I know for sure is that I'm never going back there again. I used to live on a farm when I was nine years old. In fact, it was an old schoolhouse that was about ten kilometers away from our neighbors, with lots of trees across the country, and over half an hour from town. Being a kid on a farm with lots of room, I was always exploring the bush or being out with horses and cows. We had chickens, pigeons, rabbit, peafowl, pigs, pheasants, turkeys, geese, and many other birds. I was on my way to go find the horse this day. I was always with Tony, our lead horse. She was a white horse with a black mane and tail. She was more of a foster mother to me, and I could do things with her that would just be amazing. Tony and I had a very close bond. I would climb up her tail and nap on her back as she just grazed. I would climb up her neck since she was a tall horse for a nine-year-old. Even cling and run just around her legs. I would hide under her when I was near her, and it started to rain, just as a foal would do. We used to play tag, hide and seek, and so many other games. She loved playing. This is why I was on my way to see her this day. I wanted to be with my best friend. Before you say little kids should not be outside without supervision. This was very common for me, since I even slept outside with the animals that I loved and helped care for. I was raised: if you are quiet, you will see things you'll normally miss. I always remained quiet to see the wildlife. I can't remember where our German Shepherd was, but it wasn't with me on this particular trip. When I started my trip, I knew I was probably in for a long walk, since she was likely on the other side of the property and across the lake. I crossed the pasture closest to the house, finding nests, interesting rocks, crossing the pasture to the tree line, and it took me about fifteen minutes, listening to what kind of birds had what kind of song, and what kind of animal may have crossed through. You can always find out what kind of things are going on around you if you pay attention. As I entered the tree line, things went quiet, so quiet you could hear your own heartbeat. I didn't think much of this since I probably disturbed the wildlife. No birds sang or put up a fuss as I got closer to them. There was no breeze, and the air was very still. 
It felt thick. And since I was nine years old, I just thought it was the morning dew evaporating. Most of the trees in this bush were maple or fir. I knew there was a hawk nest nearby, as well as a fox den in a ditch about 10 steps to the right. We had become aware of this problem as some of these foxes had taken some of our chickens, but I was never mad since our hens always had babies each spring. I understood that even they had to eat and they would only come to human areas if there was no other food source. Things were silent, not a bird or fox bark. I checked on the Robinson's nest to see if they were all right. As I peeked into the nest, the babies were awake, but very silent and didn't move nor blink their eyes. I moved back onto the cow trail and got the feeling that something wasn't right. No birds, no animals, not even a sound of my footfalls on the path. I moved very slowly towards the meadow that was about 500 meters from where the tree line started. It was very slow and very quiet. Halfway through the bush, I smelt it. Rotting flesh mixed with skunk and a really bad smell of death. It's amazing how fast your senses will get used to a smell and you go nose blind. I looked around and didn't see anything, no movement. So I kept going, hoping to get through the smell. As I got to the exit of the trees, there is a meadow that always have deer. But this day I got more than I bargained for. I heard grunting and growling mixed with really rough voices. And someone had a really bad sore throat. I couldn't make out the words as I was still too far to understand. I stopped to listen as I could hear snarling, growling of some kind of big animal. It didn't sound like a bear or even a moose grunting. I laid down on the ground thinking I could sneak up and see what kind of animal was making this sound. I peeked through the trees and into the meadow. And I saw something. But I didn't know what it was. I saw three creatures that almost looked like really big deer with their flesh rotting off in batches. I could see ribs and bones as if the flesh was missing. Other parts were like brown hair mixed with a really bad case of mange. The big one had large antlers with many points. There was skin or something that was shedding off the antlers and waved or fell off in pieces as it moved. Long ears like a donkey's. The side of its face had no skin at all and was bare yellowish bone. It was standing on its hind quarters as if it were a human with a bit of a hunch. This one was doing the most grunting and growling. It was watching the two smaller ones and randomly pointed with its hands. It had hands with long claws like talons. The hair this one had on its body was black. The skin was dark brown. This one was circling the other two slowly. I was expecting this one to join in the attacks. The hind legs were that of a big dog, but had hooves. I was not close enough to see the eyes, but I didn't want to approach it anymore. The smaller, darker one had a smaller set of antlers like a young deer, eight points at least. But this one was a lot meaner to the smaller of the three. Its body was lean and it was quick. It moved in flashes and when it paused, it took swipes and bites at the smallest. It was trying to use its hands with long claws and teeth, trying to attack the smaller brown one. I saw chunks of flesh being ripped off the smallest one who couldn't fight back as well as the other two. Its hands and claws were dripping with blood and flesh hung from its claws in chunks. The smallest of the three was brown with three point antlers. Only one. Its flesh was bleeding profusely from its wounds. It snarled and bared its teeth while trying to fend off the attacks. There were broken bones hanging out the flesh. The blood was so bright against its hair and skin. I could see it dripping from where the missing antler was ripped out or broken in the fight. This was not upright like the other two. This one was on all fours low to the ground and having trouble trying to get a powerful kick into the attacker or a swipe. 
I saw that its right hind leg had most of the flesh ripped off already and a leg broken. There was bone on the lower leg sticking out and bending awkwardly. There wasn't much time before I knew this was a losing battle. I must have gasped at the sight when the big brown one perked its ears and turned to me. Its eyes narrowed when its gaze focused. The eyes were bright yellow, as if there was a light behind it, almost fluorescent. It didn't take its eye off me when it said in a really rough voice, Leave. Go. I thought it was talking to me, but I was frozen in fear. I saw the two big ones run off into the trees and vanish, leaving the third behind. I was not going to approach. I was too scared to run. But just as I was about to move, I saw the small one lift its head and look at me. It growled and snarled and slowly moved to where I was. I froze. I couldn't even move. I even held my breath. I saw this creature moving for me and I couldn't move. I could see its breath now. And instead of white steam, it was pink from all the blood. Hearing a horse calling out, I looked to my right and saw our horses running towards me. My horse, with her head down in attack mode. Her nostrils flared, and she was almost screaming out. Everything went silent for a moment. Her calls were so loud they echoed in my head. I wasn't sure if my life was going to be ended by my beloved horse, or this creature heading for me out in the open. I felt doom and danger and fear. I dropped flat to the ground and called out for our horse with the herd in tow. I've never seen them run so fast. The sound of their hooves pounding the ground, which sounded hollow at this point. I saw our horses herd about eight horses in all heading straight for the thing. They attacked it. The first one to reach the creature reared up and the others surrounded it in a half circle, almost blocking my view but I could see between the consistent moving legs, the creature stand up, snarl, and snap at them. I turned my head to the lead horse, Tony, and she came running with her head down and slowed to stand next to me, gently comforting me. I stared where I was as I saw the horse herd drive it away. They stayed on attack until the things were out of sight. I hugged Tony's leg as I couldn't stand from fear. I saw her lift her head to call the herd. I was shaking so badly and breathing heavily. I thanked her for saving my life. She let me take my time to calm down and I didn't let go of her. When I was able to stand, she guided me home as I'd seen the other horses putting up a fuss, bucking and prancing, tossing their heads around as they ran back to their leader. I was scared of what was in the woods. It wasn't until I was home to ask my mum what the creature was that I'd seen. I described it to her as much as possible, and I was told deer or elk, and not to talk of it again. The next day after school, I went out to the same meadow. I'm a sucker for punishment, I know. I had to see for myself what really had happened, and I saw the blood-stained grass and dirt from where the fight had taken place. Fast forward to adulthood. I'm watching movies and hearing stories on YouTube. And that's when it clicks. I realized what I had seen and what could have happened to me when I was nine years old if the horses hadn't saved my life. It's still creepy to recall this knowing that these creatures were less than five kilometers from our home. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. Skimwalker stories. Gotta love the occasional Skimwalker video. I really liked these stories. Um, skimwalkers are always an interesting topic. Super creepy, super scary. If you enjoyed this video as well, obviously it would mean a lot to me if you would drop a like, maybe leave a comment, that's always nice. If something scary has ever happened to you, then you can send it to my email or post it on my Reddit page. So, do I have any updates for any of you regarding anything that's going on, given the current situation? Not really, no. We're currently potty training our daughter, which is fun. And uh, yep, we've had a few accidents already, but that's to be expected. Um, 
that's pretty much it, really. I would like to thank, as always, my wonderful and lovely patrons whose names are on screen. If you'd like the honour of having your name on screen, for a small amount every month, you can get just that. Check the link in the description to see what it's all about. You get some cool perks, some exclusive content, and your name at the end of every video. Well, guys, that's it from me. It's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.